Couple. <laughs> uh, if I remember, I did, I did a rough calculation, and it'll hold. It'll easily hold seven thousand index cards in this one drawer. Um, but I think it'll go like seven and a half, almost eight. Oh, you got an actual index card system behind you there. <laughs> oh, well, that's the that's the the smaller library card catalog. <laughs> so you said seven and a half, eight what? Uh, Chris, you said uh, it will hold seven and a half. Or eight, about 8,000 8, in, yeah, in this one drawer. The, this one behind me, I think I'll do 30,000 cards, maybe. Wow. I think I did a calculation once, but. How oh, yeah, to get, I, how I to get busy. <laughs> I don't know. Are they digital and you print them? Pardon? Do you print them? Like, do you, have, do you print them out? Very rarely. I type them. I type some of them with the typewriter occasionally, but most of them are handwritten. Oh, okay. Maybe a total of 10 cards in the entire house are printed. <laughs> in fact, I and it's mostly because I don't even think we have a printer here at the house. So Everybody's video keeps dropping out. This is like musical chairs. Well, as long as we can hear each other, right? Yeah, yeah, that's all that matters. I can see everybody for white oh, work. Yeah, I but, can see everyone too. You know, I think it might just be on your side. Jeremy. Really? Because I'm I'm getting each of you is dropping out like one at a time. It's acting mm -hmm. weird for me today. It's weird. Yeah. Actually, I, your bandwidth is fuzzy too. Even though it oh, says so you've got cool. a good connection. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that they uh, break seal and their emergency. <laughs> I, I do not have something like that in my Obsidian vaults. Just so you know, it's not all fun in games. I used to have a professor in undergrad who did econometrics, Jack Johnston. He was an old British guy who taught econometrics. And there was a bottle of Tio Pepe in his file cabinet. Um, so I, I wanted to ask Chris, have you thought about digitizing that? I mean, not that, you know. I I don't know. I, other than to have a backup, I'm not sure what it would be worth or I would pay somebody some nominal amount to do it possibly, but it's not. It's not worth it. I'd just be worried about, like, losing it for, like, something happening to your physical location, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a large door right here. It, other than earthquake and the whole thing coming down, which is a whole other issue to deal with. Um, if there were a fire, I could drag this out the door and it comes apart in sections so I could pick it up and take it out pretty quickly. And then the other one is a little heavier, but the three or four drawers that have mission critical stuff in them, I could take out and walk out a door pretty quickly as well. So well, that's cool. If it if it came to that, and presuming you know if there were a fire and I'm at home, right? You know, but the other thing too is the the steel cases. It's twenty gauge steel, so my guess would be it could go through fire for about an hour before I would have to worry about cards igniting and disappearing. Wow. That's pretty cool. They, they would smell like smoke when it was done, but I would still have them. Yes. <laughs> they would just carry more information in that sense. Yes. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> I think of it as a big disk drive that just takes up more space than right. the one that's on your desk. So I, I sent this uh, link that I thought, you know, I was thinking of like, how to back up such a thing. I don't know if you've seen uh, Simon Willison, uh, the guy who did a dog sheep and a data set. Mm -hmm. um, he, had, he made this experiment with the Gemini Pro. You know, you can just, with API and uh, eventually um, with the interface, presumably you can attach a video. And he actually filmed his library, like a section of his library, just like the shelves doing like this. 
and through the video to Gemini say that says like Game Jason. I don't know, I don't know if I mentioned this uh, a few weeks back, but uh, it seems relevant now. Uh, and he, he got like pretty usable JSON with a full dump of his uh, library. Essentially. So I wonder how good, uh, you know, how, how easy it could be like in a few months to just say like, you hold the phone, flip through the cards and see how far that gets you, I guess. So uh, what the, uh, oh, do you want to record this one? I've already started recording it. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Oh, cool. Yeah. And oh, and uh, because it's all hey, dude. Well, how is it out there in the world? It sounds like there are children playing. What's going on outside? What did you see? Where's the car? Hmm. Uh, that's good. That's that's coming from your audio. Yeah. I, I I have a call now. How are you hearing them? I'm not yet. I'm going to turn it on. Oh, well, all right. uh, here. Uh, he can't hear. Something. I don't think he can yeah. hear us yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sam, do you want to mute your line? There we go. Hi. Hello. Hey. We hear you. Now I can hear you. Ah, uh, getting out of here both ways. Always a little bit complicated. I'm, I'm in San Francisco for the week. Oh, cool. Hey, nice. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. We're just wrangling uh, the local Wi Fi and network is always exciting. No. Um, okay, one second. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you said you're, you're recording. I don't see the notification. I know. And, and when I started the recording, it says the other users will not be notified that you're recording. You need to tell them. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> they change the interface every time I use it. So, hey, we're being recorded, okay? Thank you. So I guess this is a finish of the uh, living call of uh, March 6, 2024. Thank you for, for doing that. Yeah. Cool. Time. So wait, we should go. Yes. It would be nice if the chat also went there. Yes. Anyway, and we were discussing uh, setting custom with an, uh, well, the best example I've seen, I guess, you know, like uh, just the notes uh, of Chris. And I think we were all like thinking uh, it would be nice to pick into those drawers. <laughs> yeah. That didn't sound good. No. All oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to speaker. So sorry. Actually, now you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant the city captain. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So backing up and so on. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Uh, uh, yeah, so what's in our minds? I guess I want to ask Jerry how uh, how was Bahrain? Bahrain was pretty, um, pretty cool. It was a good junket. I have a photo album I can share in the chat uh, with some videos. Um, uh, I figured out slowly that I was basically a beard for Philip Morris on a junket to fill their lounge because they sponsor the Ferrari team or something like that. So we had paddock access at, a, at the first Formula One race of the year. Uh, paddock access means you're above the garages and pit row in little luxury clubby suites with like food and drink and like whatever. And then they occasionally say, oh, 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 would you, do you want to go on this thing over here? So one thing is a garage tour where you actually go down into the garage, the working garage. Uh, I didn't do it during the race, but I did it for the warmups before. And they don't let you take any video or pictures there. So I have no, no proof of having been there. Um, but you're like three feet from everybody like in goggles. And then they, you know, they dress up and uh, go do a pit stop and whatever. It's really pretty cool. Uh, another thing was a, uh, a track tour, which everybody climbs onto a huge truck that has railings in the, the flatbed of the truck has railings, and then they drive the entire circuit of the race. So that was kind of cool. And a, a few other things as well. And then at one point, a guy I was talking to said, oh, there goes Verstappen. And so he and I bolted out to the hall and went next door to the next clubby suite and were 10 feet away from Verstappen as he was being interviewed before the race. So crazy stuff and, and more sort of money floating around, I guess, than you think it's, it was all a little weird, but very well run. Interesting. Hey, Jerry, what's a beard? Uh, a beard is usually, uh, <laughs> a beard is usually a guy who's covering. F no, wait, what's the usual setup? 
It's a uh, well. It's a it, woman it, who marries a guy who's woman, gay. Yeah. yeah, it's usually a yeah. woman who marries a guy who's gay to make everybody think he's uh, heterosexual. Some somebody covering up for the fact that. As opposed to a merkin, which is a different kind of beard. Never That's mind. Very true. <laughs> you know that one. <laughs> yeah. So when somebody says I'm proud to be a merkin, I think about that sometimes and I laugh. Because you mention it, I will say I had the pleasure of learning the word Merkin and its definition from John Waters himself. Oh, really? Oh, from ah, John wow. Waters? Oh, my God. And, and then three weeks later, we watched um, uh, How to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, oh. uh, in which there is a General Merkin played by George C. Scott. Mm-hmm. General I, Merkin. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't appreciated that that detail. <laughs> That's great. Well, now you can rewatch, you know, your your old Kubrick films and uh, yes. with Peter Sellers and have a have a good laugh. It's a brilliant film. Um, also, last week we had um, Rich Burton show up for the free uh, for the free jury's brain call on Monday and demo his DXOS uh, and Composer stuff, which was cool. And we're uh, next week, we're going to use Composer for note taking in our call. Um, but he's built out a bunch of stuff that I think everybody here would, would enjoy and appreciate. So if you want to. Um, I, will, I will make a space and share the link here. Nice. Awesome. Thank you. And, and also a write up uh, that I've, well, a write up that I've been putting in every space. <laughs> This is what you're actually doing. Sweet. Um, on the free week series rain call, I, I usually, I mean, I, cannot, I usually don't join. But actually, I never join, I think. So I guess I go back to, uh, I will be interested in knowing uh, uh, about progress there, whether, you know, how close to freedom your brain is. My, my brain is still walking the, the penal walk, I'm afraid. Um, gosh, this call is full of double entendres. It's weird. <laughs> um, I, I don't think we, we are meaning to. I, who uh, could be adding them to the call? How is that happening? It's just uh, it's an active, it's know. a very passive occurrence. It's a it's a subtle form of sabotage. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Pete has come close to connecting my brain to GPT through the Brains API and GPT's API, but that's not quite done, and the, the Brain support people are not being very responsive uh, coming back with it, so. so. That will be with API, or having a use a dump, like a markdown dump? Uh, that would be through the API, trying to get, uh, trying to get a, a genuine hookup so that you could query my brain. Um, Pete, uh, do you want to share the link to the file you've created? Oh, you're still creating it? Uh, yeah, it's it's worth kind of before you click the link, it's worth reading. Okay, the little reading intro. the background. Yeah, um, and and right now I'm tiny URL. Oh, okay, because <laughs> it's so big. Yeah, <laughs> I it's super funny. So the name of Rich's company is Brain Frame, and the idea is that he's creating a distributed platform that can have frames that other third parties might write. So you could have a frame that emulates the brain, for example, uh, or you could have a frame that does other stuff. And he has a, a couple sample frames, one of which is a chess game, uh, basically a distributed real-time chess game, which is, um, and you could also have an AI bot, a chat bot as a frame, uh, and you can involve it in your, in your actions in different ways. So it's highly programmable. Um. Perhaps I'll share my screen real quick, um, and you can see. Uh, uh, I, I can show you what Composer looks like before you you actually get there. Um, if I can find the right thing on. <laughs> I'm raising you now. Here it is. Um, they have a they have the share link or share icon. It's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you can see this browser window, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. um, 
So you have a personal space, and then you can have shared spaces. And obviously, I've made a couple already. Um, uh, this space has two uh, two documents in it right now. Uh, these documents are also um, uh, real time collaborative. I wonder if this works. I don't think it does. Um, But anyway, if you join this space, you'll see this space, and now you'll see this document. And you can type on it together and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you might have. That's interesting. How do I create? So the way this works is uh, you don't you don't have like an account or a login, and it's not centralized. Uh, you have a I, I presume a key pair uh, and local storage in your browser. Uh, if you want this to, if if you want your identity to be in backed up and uh, and in more than one place, you can say add device. Go to your profile settings, um, and that's also where you uh, change. You know, put your name. Interesting. Uh, it doesn't have wiki links. It does have markdown links, and I I haven't tried enough yet to know. Well. Um, uh, if you if you read the README, um, uh, there's a link to their Discord. So the Discord is pretty quiet still. I mean, it's there's stuff that going on, but um, I would definitely encourage you to join the, the Discord. This it, and it looks useful. It looks like a, a fun thing to. I mean, it does a lot of the stuff that I try to do with HackMD and Obsidian mm -hmm, together with mm -hmm. with groups. So, um, so I've got. It's kind of it. it's sort of like a programmable Google Docs, and and then Composer is just a little toy app that they built on top of DXOS. So it's not mm -hmm. like you know they're done. This is just a cool demo, and you can and it's they made it a practical demo. And you can pick what's under the hood for DXOS. So I think sort of the default is IPFS for distributed file store, but you could connect it to other engines, whatever. So. This is really what happens when you go offline? Uh, the, you go offline? The universe collapses inwardly, and we all die. Ouch. Yeah. I there's there's something saved a disk or something somewhere. I, I can't yeah. remember. I'm really interested in how it works, um, especially this log. Like, presumably, if my browser expires storage and my device expires storage your identity is gone right i, I, I don't know how so, yeah. logging on on my device would help with that <laughs> uh well if you're logged in on two devices um then either one of them can expire and you'll still have your identity right right but i still have to return to the site within my expiration date in order to from each device retain or, my or identity. from one or the other I, you know, the, I, I think even in settings, um, or someplace, no, I, I saw someplace you could save, uh, you, you know, the other thing you can, uh, when you say oh, add there's device, there's a link to save files. Yeah, you get, yeah, but uh, saving cool. it to my, my device storage in my browser like it's not exporting it uh so the the thing to do is um i i think and maybe i'm wrong i think if you go to add a device and then save that url or the qr code to something offline then you can always you know you could always bootstrap back up so i don't know yeah, that's true Yeah. Interesting. Uh, it looks a bit like fission. Maybe is it the, is it also yeah. within the uh, BFS and so on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I mean, it is a fission. I think uh, yes. You are screwed in fission. With fission. I think uh, last I checked, uh, if you lose all your devices, you have you know enough backups. Yes. So in that sense, I don't know of any distributed uh, system that I was around that. Uh, it's it's easy enough to back up that. Uh, you know, the add device link. 
And, and Sam, uh, is this, SJ, where did you find the export private key thing? I don't see private key, just under settings, spaces, save file to, files to disk. It lets you specify. Uh, right, it. Okay. Yeah. Rich is um, urging us to give it a go as Pete's doing. So give it a try. And yeah, I think and it, he's super happy oh, yeah, to get feedback just, too. So, you know, go to Discord yeah. and. and... Very good. Cool. Yeah, I'd say that you can you can copy the device invite link. Of course, you can only use it one time, but that should get you returned to your login if all your devices expire. Uh, I mean, the nice thing to, I think, like the nice thing would be if it does what, like, uh, what Noster does, right? Where you yeah. can just store your private key somewhere, yeah. um, private, hopefully. And then use that to log in if you lose your login. Yeah. Halo Echo. So it, are they developing Halo Echo and Mesh, or those are? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's all them. OK. Arkeo, what? Sorry. Curious. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So do we want to, I guess, experiment with these? Maybe we could... a, a, a good chunk of this, or all of it, or something, is open source, by the way, too. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You get a good so, if you wanted to yeah. take, well, um, I, I'm wondering how you, if you could build an Agora frame for it, and then have communications into the Agora. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I did go there. Yes, I, <laughs> I was thinking of that. Yeah, Pete, you were thinking of it? Yeah. I guess I was thinking, uh, could we, how easy would it be to export to Markdown? To uh -huh. do a dump of all the files. It, it's using Markdown. Yeah, so it shouldn't be too hard. No? And you can build yeah. something that resembles a web page. I mean, you can sort of do web publishing yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm not sure exactly how. Yeah. I'm really interested in the. I guess the Echo and Halo stuff. Yeah. Echo sounds a lot like Hypercore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, actually, let me copy and paste a, uh, a Discord message from Zenya, Zenya? Um, from October last year. Uh, Wait, can, can you link between? files in the XOS? Uh, I, I haven't tried it yet. Let me try. Seems to be the only link I kind of I, I find is indeed a Markdown link. Yeah, that's what so I just saw. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So maybe not yet. It, no. You could do a Markdown link to the the URL yeah. of another page. Right? There's yeah, also yeah. in the settings, there's a whole bunch of stuff features you can turn on. Um, you'll see the plugins currently set up, yeah. and there's a bunch, bunch of different things that are kind of there. Okay. Oh, save files to disk. Oh, so you can actually save that file to disk like right now, apparently. Also has GitHub integration. Oh, that I like. Rich actually demoed that, and I don't remember. I think, and I don't remember anything about it. Yeah, me neither. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, you uh, can just select the folder. Go ahead. No, good to note that like the add device link 
uh, like arriving at it adds the device. There's not an additional, I don't think there's an additional authentication step, or maybe there isn't just because of like, I'm already logged in here. I just, I accidentally pasted it into my Obsidian and then it crawls it and then the device code expired. Hmm. Um, okay. Save. Uh, by the way, the, the DXOS founder, Rich Burden, um, has a lot of, like, you, you go, oh, wow, he did that uh, kind of stuff, including uh, he was one of the early engineers uh, on the brain. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Can't be bothered to, to sign in the link in to actually see his CD, <laughs> but <laughs> I know it's cool. Well, cool. It's like throwing raw meat to tigers or something. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so he in what sense, where are these UUIDs tracked? How is it resolving this to something that we can both share? Let's say. Oh, it is hypercore. It is OK, hypercore. that makes sense. I was like, just oh. the heuristics of how this works smells like hypercore to me. Hmm. And uh, oh. lo and behold, it is hypercore. <laughs> Okay, that's okay. actually that's cool. I like it more because <laughs> yes, I, the more convergence. Really yes, yeah, more convergence. I, honestly, hypercore and like putting hypercore on the web is really cool in the way that they're doing it. It's like it's a shame that blue Ho uh, not bluehost the the Twitter alternative blue, blue sky whatever blue sky. Blue, sky. blue sky. It's a shame that blue sky poached hypercore's lead developer because. Yeah, because Hypercore is like easily the most interesting technology project <laughs> I've seen in like a decade. Wow. Um, it's so this is that's very cool. Okay, I understand what's happening. And Hypercore is the renaming of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. SJ, if you hit that last link in chat, um, I, I think that'll start answering questions for you. Cool. Uh, yes, and I think the idea of taking the data and like building a product or a new stack on top of it makes sense. Uh, yeah, my reading of the is that Professor C moved on. Um, he did Citizen, which was actually very promising. And then he turned it down and did Blue Sky. And I think, you know, that's going off in the direction. So, but what a, what a streak. Huh? Yeah, um, dude yeah. is a very good developer. It's sort of insane that. I don't know it, it, that he didn't have like the capacity to find funding on his own, right? Yeah. That's how he ended up there. He tried to he tried to do it on his own and he could not get funding. Uh, and honestly, it sort of makes me even more of a fan of Hypercore because it just it goes to show that I don't think that this technology aligns well with the incentives of Silicon Valley funders, which sounds like a profounding vote in the right direction to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's hard to know that negative votes are actually in the right direction. <laughs> it, it is, but uh, it's certainly it, well, it's a good indicator, right? Like, I don't know the the techno the underlying technology here is so impressive, and to see funders pop onto things that are much less impressive um, and not on this in well, like any way. Welcome to capitalism. Right? You could say, oh, well, maybe it's mm -hmm. a, a failure of technology, but. VC has funded so many other failures, right? Much less promising projects that were much less further along. Um, so I see it as an indicator that doesn't fall within the politics of the VC world. And I don't either. So that works for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. It does remind me, though, I don't know if you saw this, but like Open Collective is having problems, apparently. Uh -huh. Yeah. What kind of problems? Uh, I believe they had to close down their U.S. branch. Why? Um, let me see if I can find. That's, the that's blog. one of those things that maybe it's not. You know, failing in the U.S. is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, this is the communication, I think. 
Yeah, we use Open Collective for social call. So we were in shock, but apparently this is not going to affect us. So the Ripon organization is OK. I don't see anything about this. Yeah, for whatever reason, it hasn't hit the news. But there, I put, I see Flancy and put in a link, and I put in a link as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Hmm. So the US based 501c3 dissolves. The 501c6 is okay, whatever that means. And the fiscal host, uh, or whatever it is. And the European base is okay. Yep. I mean, it's definitely bad news. You know, the, the types of projects, again, like. The types of projects that found support through OCF were ones that didn't fit within the traditional tech innovation structure for the most part. And I think it'll be very difficult for them to regain funding into some new system or version. No. It's hard to keep track of the entities and understand how they're different from each other. Yep. Yeah, me too. Aram, I think that's the your exact keyboard. specifics of OCS decision to dissolve are not known to us. <laughs> that's, yeah. That is, uh, and it says that it, is not because it's regulatorily hard to operate in the US. They just screwed up. It says it came as a surprise to us, and everybody had to hustle to figure this out. So it's, it is something weird going on. Yeah, the, <clears> yeah. There, are, there are like 12 red flags in this update. I'm so glad it's not <laughs> I, can, I can promise you that OCF did not have a good auditor of their books. Mm. Or maybe a, they had, didn't have a good lawyer. Or both. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this is a good time, but I wanted to like maybe uh, pick back up the the thread we have. So first, I so, so, sorry. First, Samuel had a question on the UIDs, which uh, something interesting it, to me, but I don't know the answer. It's to. not that important. I'm oh. I'm I'm very salty about projects like this. It does not do any of the things that I need from a fellowship of the link. Uh, but I I don't. Um, I don't think it's, it doesn't matter. People like uh, it, know. and 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 it's a it's a good implementation of something else. So, so wait, which of the projects are you talking about now, SJ? Sorry, just um, yeah. this flavor of compulsive. Th this um, this definition of local first. Oh, oh okay. I see. Uh, so okay, I, 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 needed, I needed to know what you meant. Yeah, what, what you were pointing Sorry. out. Sorry. No, that's okay. If, if, if I collaborate with the kinds of groups that I work with in Composer, in five years, I'm sure whatever we make will be gone and no one will have a copy. And that's the opposite of what I need. I would much rather use a website and a platform that are going to go away that the Internet Archive can archive properly. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, couldn't, yeah. Couldn't, you include, couldn't you include a copy to the archive or something like that and just rely on that? This kind of... Um, URL naming that does not encourage dense internal hyperlinking across a site is not all that friendly to site links. I mean, you could hack anything together in a way that could be archived. Huh. But um, yeah. at that point, why are you doing this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, I, I mean, you could use this in a local first way, but it's actually not really local first. It's, it's more distributed cloud, which Right. You do this if you're really excited Agreed. about building a distributed cloud with all the signing and identification, and that, yeah, yeah that yeah. the idea that you care so much about the signing means that you're also going to prevent people from all kinds of recovery yeah. and saving. Like, oh, you can't prove you're the same person. Sorry, like this isn't for you. So, right, right, right. No, I think it's, I, it's good I, I for a lot of things where um, you need some kind of strong upfront. Uh, you need hard security rather than soft security. What's a what's a what's a better what's a better architecture in contrast? Um, it, it's it's not a question of better. It's it's a question of use cases. 
Yes, so something that, that lets you? you make incremental statements about provenance that people can later argue about and check, rather than having a strictly encoded option for provenance and like ability to see a thing. I send myself a, a, a URL to one of these pages in a different browser, and I can't see the thing in the other browser. I have to like go into the tool and invite. It's it's just different. Is is there a system yeah. that does the thing you're describing? But what Essie is talking about, Massive Wiki, is pretty good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Like, that, like, like I'm, I... I'm not sure that the Internet Archive could archive this. When I try to yeah. access the things that we just made in our space um, in a different browser, I can't see it. Yeah, I just had the same problem. Um, I think like yeah, because I think the the invite link is like limited time, but. I, to your point, like this should be generating, even if it has to I, see, that's what made me think of hyper. It's clearly got like that long string. That's a hyper path, right? So it's essentially a torrent for this website that we're all sharing, having it open. But even with that, like you can and should have downstream from that path URLs, right? The You should be able to go to the readme and it should be slash... Uh, fellowship of the link slash readme or something like that. Uh, and lacking that's a big problem for archiving. Also, like, <sighs> yeah, I mean, I think the technology is really cool and the underlying stuff is really cool. And it just, but it does, again, like the the loss in terms of the hyper community, right? This did work in the hyper-based browser, Beacon or whatever it was called. Where you where things did have URLs like that, um, it's certainly possible with this technology. I think, though, to your point, it has to do with um, the prioritization of the project, right? Yeah, I, they yeah. yeah they have an assumption that strong identity and um, privacy are are keystones of the way they want to work together, which makes sense for you know certain certain use cases i would say yeah <laughs> we need we need a society and a community such that we can say that doesn't work for our use case and then do something else i've i've stopped going to most distributed web gatherings and meetups because people can't distinguish between the two and it's like going to lots of creative commons meetups and trying to talk about free licensing for knowledge and people don't get it like everything they do is nc and nd and they're very proud of being creative commons it's like but that is fully incompatible with most free software products and they just don't understand it. Like, no, what do you mean? We're part of free culture. And the decision to do that and not to have a separate free culture organization was really harmful to the long-term mm -hmm. integration of knowledge and, and code in these communities. So we should, let's let's help articulate spaces that uh, are always prioritizing mm -hmm. uh, flexible, continuous collaboration with a public that you aren't expecting so, to- I'm, I'm, I'm hearing- we are back to Markdown on Git as a lingua franca with Wikilinks. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we were proposing we switch over to DXOS. No. It's just interesting but to explore. It is. Yeah. It is, and I think it's interesting to think, you know, can we be a bridge? Can a, a community using this yeah. tool, can it be welcome into like, I mean, I'm putting, I'm saying Markdown on, on, on Git because it's my, you know, like, it's what I prefer. And can we bring a, a, a bidirectional bridge which kind of information would make the cross, which kind of information will be lost? I think those are usually interesting questions when thinking about integration of systems. And yeah, uh, uh, for sure I, I am in the, on the lingua franca camp, and I think like many of us, just because it makes linking easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think like there's, I think the thing that something like this shows is like, it could be possible to consume this into something that is more properly in the type of hierarchy we could prefer though. Like there's a nice API yeah. wrapper, there's a TypeScript thing, but it certainly wouldn't happen automatically. That's for sure. Well, it has GitHub integration, for example. So couldn't you just be pushing everything you create out as, into Markdown files on GitHub so that somebody could pick them up in a more normal way with a more normal URL whenever? It's just that when they're inside the system, they have these hypercore URLs instead. Kind, kind of the way SJ said it is like years from now, 
it's all going to be like we won't have any access to it too so the capability that you can push it out is different from the the fact that that happens as part of the operation of the system so yeah. massive wiki as the, because of the way it works everybody has a local copy no matter what kind of you know that's the very first thing that you have is a local copy mm -hmm. um and and you and you can't you can't even collaborate if you don't have a local copy you know um so the ability to do a backup at any time is different from that's it's just you know it's the the way that the, the core protocol works do, being able to do a backup means that sooner or later people won't do backups which means sooner or later things are gonna get lost yes i see what you mean uh, it's com it's it's frustrating because this is an attempt at a distributed open source platform that looks really interesting that has lots of programmability etc cetera, etc cetera. I would never have come to the conclusions that y'all are coming to now, partly because I don't understand the issues the way you guys do. Um, I I don't think it's frustrating. It it just well, it's frustrating. I, I, and I actually I think it's kind of cool. It, there's a completely different you know technological technological architecture, different uh, you know. I, there's I offhand I can't think of one, but I'm sure there are use cases where this this architecture is. is so every time somebody said there's a problem that in in this uh, conversation, you know it's uh, it, it's not a bug in a different use case. It's actually a feature. Everything we talked about as a problem is a feature that they wanted that contributes to a certain kind of um, collaboration and a certain kind of cooperation. Even I, I think SJ's SJ's statement. I'm, I I can't quite quote it back, but SJ said. When you set up the architecture like this, you know, you don't get the advantage of an open society. It's just, you know, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It doesn't mean it no. just means that, you know, it's a thing. Yeah. But that's what I said. I, I don't think we need to talk too much about it. I, I, I get salty about it because I see discussions about tools like this creep into all of my communities. Mm -hmm. And in many of them, people actually don't want what these are, but they are excited about it because it came from another project like that that they really liked. Right. I think the idea of that was not this. The idea of that was how do you distribute very large data sets to everyone when they're meant to be public, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of projects have converged into this space. And um, let's just make sure that doesn't take over everything. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's good to have it just to your point, it shouldn't take over everything. Uh, I, I do think it's a really interesting project. I'm not like down on it at all for its particular use case. I think it's really cool. And like as a use of technology, it's really cool. I like I, I want to explore the code because I could easily see how like it could be remapped into something that works more like what we're talking about. Right. To, to SJ's point, like these are product choices that have been made for a particular set of goals. Right. But they were also like, like they don't have to be the choices. You could take the same stack of technology and make choices that hit the types of goals that like we are interested in to have real links, to have like built in concepts of backups, like, even to author it down to Markdown and archive it effectively, right? Like for a really good example of this is like Glitch. Glitch, for example, is a really cool piece of software that does a lot of cool things and it publishes to the web. And a lot of its stuff is built on the idea that you're going to build a server and then serve stuff off of the server. Um, and like, it's really cool. I love glitch.com. I love the idea of being able to really quickly spin up a server, but like the inherent limitations of that is that it is fundamentally not very stable in the medium to long term, mm -hmm. right? All my glitch projects still fundamentally work, but they will probably die. Um, and so like one pattern that I developed out of glitch that like you could see being here is right. I, I have a glitch project that archives itself whenever it serves a page, right? So that way I know that this data that I put in there is retained and it can sync to GitHub as well. But like also it builds a URL, it 
builds a static file. It can pull, push a link to archive.org and I can very easily, or some future person could very easily go into this project, see the server isn't working, not give a shit and take the static HTML files that are generated um, and do whatever the hell they want with it. Right. So like, again, it's, it's about like what the priorities of the particular project are. I don't think glitch is made to last, right? Like, or the, the company is, but the individual glitches are not made to last. They're meant for you to do fun experimental things. Um, so if you want to put something on there, that is something you want to retain, like you make different choices than the default glitch choices. It's, all within the realm of possibility here. Um, but somebody has to make the choice. Somebody has to make the alteration. Somebody has to build the different thing. Um, and this project, maybe one day we'll get to that. Maybe it won't. But I do think it's useful to take inspiration from in terms of them doing a cool thing, even if the ends are not the ends we seek. But that, that may be the bigger issue for the broader public's perspective, too, is some of these upfront choices have second and third order effects, both on the communities that are within them, as well as the companies that run them, that in some sense determine who has the power. So in the case of Facebook, we can close things off just enough that all the power aggregates to us because we're accumulating the data and we can do things with that data that is much harder for the smaller person to deal with. Or, or things like Creative Commons, that your choice of a license will have second and third order effects that you may not think of as an individual. Or my project is open source and chooses this license versus that license has long-term effects on how useful or not your software may be or how it's picked up and used. And people in this group may have some idea of what that looks like five or 10 years from now, but the broader public is just lost. And they just see, here's a list of choices I can choose. Oh, I want to choose the most restrictive Creative Commons license because that sounds good for right now, but they don't think about five years from now, 10 years from now, once I'm dead, you know, we're having the ability to, to choose licenses based on whether you're alive or dead or how your software is used. Um, but those things, you know, essentially have longer term effects than most people are able to intuit from the point that they choose them. Um, and we should try and make seeing that or here's an example of if you choose this what could potentially happen so glitch maybe because they lower the bar can create a, a cambrian explosion of experimentation and something may come out of it that you then take out of that experiment and move to its own separate project and build the infrastructure and run it either as a company or as an open source something and it, it then doesn't need to live within glitch to have its life, but it lowers the bar for you to experiment. Some similar to the way that, you know, Google storage or AWS made it a lot easier for people to not have to build and maintain their own servers. So you can, ex, you know, you can ex, play around and explore space without having to spend thousands of dollars on thousands of your own servers to get something up and running. So, so Chris, are you sort of saying that the hoi polloi should be using a platforms that have a set of default settings that favor the commons, or I, I don't know exactly what you would, what you would have them be, but if, if, the, if, if making things durable and visible, uh, is a, is a, a set of choices that nobody's going to make, then we lose we lose those choices because nobody's going to know to make them. So, so the platforms ought to have these things set as defaults. I, ideally, but the, the issue becomes a, a, you're the platform. So we, we just looked at open collective a few minutes ago. That is a platform for how do we fund ourselves? How do we do something? 
and when their board is not watching and not paying attention and that's, oh, suddenly we have to shut a whole bunch of stuff down, that then kicks out all the people who followed along in that choice. Um, so it would be nice to have, here are a list of initial choices that you could make or that a company could make or a group or an organization could make. And here are the likely second and third order effects of what those or affordances that come out of those choices. So that when Facebook starts up, someone can say, hey, the way they're siloing data off and making it, you know, I, in the very early days, I remember Robert Scoble said, oh, hey, I can import my address book of five or 10,000 people. And suddenly there's an efflorescence of connections I can make. But then two or three months later, when Facebook turns off the ability for you to export that data back into some other place or to export all those links of people you found, or they turn off the API access to let you dovetail with it, that dramatically changes what that product is and how it works. And the slow shutting down of how Facebook dealt with their data has had long-term effects on slowly trapping everyone in. So your project starts out and seems open, but over time it slowly closes in on itself. And is that good for you as a user? Is that good for you as a company? You know, but nobody really looks at those small shifts in the long-term effects until it's way too late. So now everybody who's tired of Facebook and wants to go somewhere else doesn't have the data portability you may have had a decade ago if you exported your data at that point versus doing it now, let's say. So I, we just, uh, we're not good at looking at those long-term no. shifts based on the tiny little building block changes that happen along the way. Yeah, so it seems, yeah, I mean, completely agree. I mean, it seems like we're talking about, you know, the coordination problem, right? Like, as in, in this case, coordinating how how a group of people can coordinate on the best defaults, for example, in this case. So best default licenses, best default settings, you know, and how can we keep them up to date, right? As in, for example, like, uh, websites become adversarial. They get initiated as, you know, the relatively new world goes. And, you know, we can hear about it, but the, we have no good choice on for coordinating. Like you say, Chris, leave it the platform. Uh, this is what it actually is actually hampering the failures and uh, is strengthening all the wall gardens, right? The cost of coordination there. So, so this is where like I always like you know I dream of this coordination tool. You know, if we could like so, I, and I I think I asked this at some at some point. So like you know, in my mind. We should minimize the number of bits we need to transfer over the air to coordinate. What what is the shortest amount? What is the shortest string we can tell each other? That we'll you know we're we'll, we'll gonna think we we'll could say just remember this word, and then any any time you need a default, any time you you know you need to find a, like a, like a coordinated way of going forward. This is the coordination strategy. So I think so you're arguing we should all change our keyboards to APL keyboards. <laughs> uh, I'm just a symbol there, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah that yeah. should fix everything. I can see how that would right, be a strategy. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, uh, and this could be, I really believe that this could be as simple as, as saying, this is a place, this is a basic wiki, this is the Agora, this is a shared uh, a notes platform, this is a social network we're going to use. Uh, and from there, building on a protocol. But uh, to some extent, I mean, I mean, maybe it's my, my head is shaped like DNS or something. You know, it's like saying, go to the site to look for the strategy. Uh, I cannot think of something that is as easy to communicate as that and as powerful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although you say that, and I wonder too, because I don't think I've ever seen what is the Agora's, you know, Creative Commons policy. So, you know, one of the reasons I, I, appreciate some of the affordances of the UI that Hypothesis has as an annotation tool. And almost no one probably notices 
that every annotation on the platform is automatically given a CC zero license. Yeah. But it's a useful thing if you want to go and use someone else's writing or work on that. It's, you know, phenomenal okay. for, you know, yeah, it's yeah. there and just take it. Um, and, and I, I love that. Most... Yeah. Please go ahead. Um, so does the Agora have a specific license? Well, that's the thing. Uh, the I mean, the Agora uh, doesn't. The Agora is created, whatever is in in writing is Creative Commons, but the Agora itself doesn't have anything in it. It's just a, a shell. It's like a tool you point at like a, a list of, of repositories, each of which has the license of the author of the repository. So you know, uh, I I thought of having a scraper that says in the repository page, uh, you know, uh, so essentially per user. Uh, each of these is likely to have a completely different license, and many of these don't have any license or have whatever uh, GitHub, uh, you know, set up for the user. Um, and then the algorithm just goes and like scrapes it all, puts it in like a big bag, cross links it and serves it. And you may be, you know, you may think that it has its own content, but it's actually all coming off site. So essentially, it, it, the each user sets the, sets the license. Uh, this will change, of course, once we have like an editor that is hosted. Um, uh, but uh, until now, you know, we don't have that. I mean, it reminds me too of the re 